They're just waiting for us to tell them. Tell them something, right? Like, uh, I, th- when I s- look around the world today, um, there's two things I think are lacking. Hope and love. <laughs> like, I, I, I'm seeing there's, there's a missing thing, especially in our culture today, that, um, that in the past, um, I've seen glimmers of it. And I think in our culture, there's glimmers of this. But what we're learning is that Jesus, Jesus lived in such a way that he always did these two things. He always brought hope and he always loved. And so we're learning through this series over these next, uh, over the six-week series, what does that mean? What does that look like for us who are Christians, who are Christ followers? What does that mean to bring hope and love always? Now, last week was kind of the foundational talk of this uh, series and kind of laid out um, the whole series and and celebrated some things as a church because, guys, you're awesome. Did you know that? Like, this is an awesome place. This is awesome what God is doing in the the midst of our church because we started last summer with a series called um, For the World. Who is here for that series? Just a show of hands so I know who I'm talking to, right? For the world, we talked about our global impact, meaning we were going to make an impact, not just in our backyard, but across the sea. You know, we wanted to help spread the gospel and, and, uh, and be an influence uh, for Jesus Christ, not just here, but other places throughout the world. And so we've, we've done some things. And I was telling you, I was so proud of our church, of what we stepped into, things that I have wanted to do from day one. And it's, it's taken us like 10 years to get there, but we're there. And that's a huge thing to celebrate. So we went from like zero to 30,000. That's pretty fast, isn't it? Like not miles per hour, but like very little dollars to, as a church body altogether, we are giving over $30,000 a year towards things that are outside of us globally. Um, That's um, sponsoring Compassion Kids in the Dominican Republic. That's us um, sponsoring missionaries who are leaving to go to the Dominican next year to lead the efforts, not just there, but in all the Caribbean, of church planning and movements and helping people in poverty and helping reach the loss in those communities. We are investing in that as a church out of our budget and then investing in Kevin McGee, who is a part of our Converge Worldwide movement of churches, where he's now partnering with local churches and missionaries who are on the the ground in all these places across the world and we're supporting him to help with that connection those relationships between churches and other pastors around the world we're in we're invested so good job guys way to go right Woo! isn't it good to be celebrate some things right i think so often in life we forget to celebrate things right each day there's something to celebrate and i think sometimes we end the day with like Whew, that was tiring. But like, remember, like, what did we, what happened today? What was the good? What can we celebrate? So uh, that's just a little practical thing. Do that in your own life. Like, each day, what can I celebrate? Or what do I need to celebrate in somebody else? When I see somebody else winning, or somebody else succeeding, or somebody else doing something, it's like, that's awesome. What do you do to high five them? Way to go! Who needs that? I'm just showing hands. Who, who would like that every day, right? So why don't we do it? And actually, when you start doing things like that, you start receiving it back. Did you know that? You become the change agent in the workplace, in your school, all those kind of things. So I'm saying let's celebrate those things. Uh, and then we talk about local impact, meaning that we've stepped out this summer and through last year of doing things to make a local impact on our community. Things like all the free food that's coming in and through the men's fraternity group every single week that they have to get rid of. I know, uh, was it last week? I think they got like, I don't know how many boxes of Twinkies. That's just Jesus right there, right? That's just, I mean, come on now. Um, Right, so, (laughs) and other things too, but there's other food that that goes through there. But just giving it away and being a blessing and and the outreaches that are being done in the community just to do that with families that have needs. For us as a church, benevolence needs that we see people who have specific needs. We're reaching out or meeting those needs. Now, I want to let you guys, church family, those of you who are church body here, um, let you know what we do as a church because there are more and more people who have needs and there are people inside the church and outside of the church, maybe people you know who have needs. And we've got, a, we've got processes in place to help them. Um, if they need some help, uh, we have a form for them to fill out so that we know how to help them and what they really need. And then so that we can engage and plug into helping meet that need, whether it's us as a church out of our budget. And just so you know, we're like, we've spent triple of what we put in our budget for benevolence this year. And that's okay. Because Jesus says, support, give, support the poor, you know, to the needy and the homeless and the broken. And so we do that. It's not like, well, we reached our budget, no more helping people, right? Like, that's not how it goes. But at times what we do is we see a need, and it's like, we don't have it in our budget, and we don't have it in the bank account, and we reach out to our church and say, hey, guys, here's a need, or to our small groups, hey, here's a need, can you guys pitch in? And it's so cool. Every single time, people jump in. That's just a generous church. We're not a rich church by any means, but I'd rather be generous than rich. 
and, uh, and God blesses that. So we're making an impact locally. But this series, we're going to this next level, and we're not talking about that. We're, 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 we've gone global. We're making a local impact, but what does it mean to make a personal impact? I mean, you personally, how can you make an impact for Christ in the world that you live in around the people that you meet with every single day? And, and what we're saying that we want to do in every single one of those relationships is bring hope and love always. I'm hoping that phrase doesn't just become like a sermon series. I'm really hoping that that kind of embeds itself into our soul and into our minds and that when we're doing anything as a church family or we're doing an outreach or we're, we're uh, at our workplace that we're in a, maybe even a difficult situation, that it would become that reminder, what should I do in this situation? Well, I'm going to bring hope and I'm going to love always. And today we're going to talk a little bit more about that and what that means um, for all of us. Because here's the verse, right? In, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse, just verse 15, we're challenged to do this. Always be prepared, meaning like you've got you to be ready to do this. Um, to what? To give an answer to everyone who asks to give the reason for the hope that you have. The reason that you have hope inside of you. And uh, in this series, I'm really, I'm, I am just, you know, I'm talking to the Christians in the room. So if you're not a Christ follower and you're kind of like, this whole Jesus stuff, I don't know about it yet. I don't know about God. I'm just here because I'm curious. I always say, welcome. We're so glad you're here. You can listen in. And honestly, the things you're going to hear, I'm hoping that you'll be like, well, I wish Christians acted like that, right? Like, <laughs> um, because when they, when we do and we look more like Jesus, um, we actually become the church. And so if you're not a Christian, it's okay, man. Welcome. I'm glad you're here, but we want to be able, for you, we want to give a reason for the hope that we have, right? That we actually like being Christians. Like, it's not just kind of like, well, I, I gotta be a Christian. Like, no. Like, there's something that God has done inside of us that's changed us, that has brought life to us in such a way that's like, I love being with, with God. And so, uh, and so we gotta learn this. How, how do we give that answer for the hope that we have in us? And we talked about hope last week, Right? The bring hope part. And what is hope? And the difference between like hope that we use in, in like everyday senses, like boy, uh, for me it was, I hope I get a Dairy Queen blizzard. Do you guys remember that message? Who went to Dairy Queen last week? Anybody went to Dairy Queen last week? All right. Thank you. You listened to the sermon. You did the right thing. All right. But the whole thing was like, you know, like we use words like that. I hope I get a blizzard or I hope I get da 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 da. And, and that word hope is based on uncertainty, right? It's, I don't know if it's going to happen or not. I don't know if I'm going to get that or not. And that's not the way we use hope when we're talking about our hope in Christ. Our hope in Christ isn't uncertainty. It is assurance. Meaning we know he's proven himself by his promises over and over and over again. In our own lives, in, in history, we see his promise always fulfilled. His word to his promise was always yes. Remember that? And amen, which means so be it. It's going to happen. And so our hope, that hope that we're bringing is what we have that gives us the insurance, the assurance knowing God is going to show up. God is up to something, and God will fulfill his promises every time, all the time, all the time. And so that's what we're walking into. How do, then do, we, how do we share that hope that we have? You know? how, how do we know for sure that we have that in the depths of our heart? What does it look like? Um, see, there's a, there's a myth, I think, when it, we think about Jesus and the reasons he came. And, um, and if you have worship programs, I always have some fill-in-the-blanks on those worship programs. And this morning, I just have a couple for you. Uh, if you're one of those note takers like to pay attention you're like okay what did I missed it oh he's at the other slide um and then you cheat off your neighbor that's okay um this isn't school you don't get graded at the end all right but some fill in the blanks for you to, to fill in uh, but I think there's a myth when we think about why Jesus came and some people think Jesus came to make us better people or Jesus came to make my life easier or Jesus came to make me nicer or fill in the blank there's all these kind of things like jesus came to da 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 and and really none of those are quite true they may be half truth you you probably will become a better person you probably will become nice you probably there will be change but that's not the reason he came to make you that he came to make you something more and and, and something of a calling and that's that's what i'm going to talk about this morning not just a nicer person, not just, not just uh, you know, I get along with people better, or I'm not as angry as often, or my fuse has gotten longer, you know, <laughs> like some of us, that's a win, you know, <laughs> like, like if you should have known me before, man, <laughs> blow up, and like, now it's, I got 10 more seconds on that, you know, like fuse, that's awesome, let Jesus do that and change us, 
But honestly, he didn't come just to make us better. That's not why he came. And last week we talked about this in Luke 19.10. This is what Jesus said, right? For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. It's your first fill in the blank. You can write that in there. That the Son of Man came to say these words with me, to seek and to save the lost. That's why he came. He's seeking out people who are lost, who have no hope. And he's, he's looking for them today. He, all around us, even in this room today, in the community out there, everybody around us, he is seeking people who are lost. And this is what he wants to do. He wants to save them. And that's not just like a, a little word like, I'm here to save you. It's not like a Superman complex, like, you know, that kind of thing. He did it. He paid his, his own life for yours, right? That word to save the lost wasn't just a simple thing. It cost him everything on the cross to die for you, for me, for our sins, to pay for the penalty that we should have received for our sin, which is death. And not just physical death, but death forever. He came to bring us life and life to the full. And so Jesus came not just to make us better people, not just to make us nicer or shorter fuses or fill in the blank, whatever that thing is. He came to seek and to save the lost, and then he calls us to be a part of the same story. We then get to represent this Jesus who said, he's here to seek and save the lost, and this is what he wants us to do. Jesus wants to make us fishers of men. Fishers of men. Write that down, and then we'll go into it, okay? Because some of you are like, that's weird. You know, that kind of thing. Like, it's an it's a metaphor, all right? So we're going we're gonna to see what he's going to do here in Luke, in the book of Luke, in just a moment. He's called us as Christians to come alongside him, to seek and to save the lost. He's doing the seeking. He's asking us to open our eyes to who he is seeking and then bring them to him so he can save them. We're not the saviors. We, I can't save anybody. I can't pay for your price. I can't do it. I can't, I can't even change you, right? Like, I can't do that boy, it would, be, it would be nice if I could, right? Like any parents in the house? Wouldn't it be great if you could just change people, you know? Like teachers full of classroom students, right? It's like, ah. The thing is, we're not, we're not the, the ones that cause change. We can present opportunities for people to change, but it's always choices, right? And so for us, our job is to be on the mission that Jesus has called us to, to seek and to save the lost, and join him into the story that we have already have a hope and we already have a salvation. And we're going to be ready to present why it's inside of us. Does that make sense? All right, y'all with me? Yep. Let's get into God's word. Let's, let's do some storytelling. I love storytelling. I love it. So we're going we're gonna to look at a story of Jesus when he was calling his disciples. He was trying to find uh, some ragtag, you know, crazy guys to like join him in this mission to like save the world. And, uh, and it's interesting who, who he chose and, and who he wanted alongside him, these disciples. Because uh, you'd think that they were probably the smartest, highest ed- educated, they're probably the most religious, you know, all the fill in the blank. But really, most of them know. Like, they were actually um, some of the craziest guys you could think of to pull alongside of you to start this whole movement called the church to be the ones that are on the mission to be fishers of men to seek and save the lost. And so if you have a Bible, I want to encourage you to join me in Luke chapter 5. I say every week, bring your Bibles, um, because we get into it. We read it every, every week. We get into Scripture. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, we, we do have free Bibles in the back. Now, can I tell you guys just real quick, this is a side note. Um, for those of you who are part of New Hope, I've been transitioning which versions of the Bible I teach out of. I don't know if you've noticed that. Uh, for a long time, I just taught out of the NIV, and there's nothing wrong with the NIV. Actually, it's a really easily read version of the Bible, and there's all sorts of versions, like lots and lots of versions of the Bible. And, um, and so the NIV, if, if you're like new to Christ and like you're new to reading the Bible, that's a great version. I would say that for us as a church, we would say grab a copy of that. We actually have free Bibles that are NIV Bibles. Um, grab those, read those. They're easy to understand. Um, you're going to see that I'm starting to teach out of the NASB, which is the New American Standard Bible. And, uh, and it's a little different than NIV because it's actually word-for-word word translation from the original language, Greek and Hebrew. So it's a little bit more accurate in its actual wording. 
And so when I study the Bible, that's what I use to study because I want to be sure I know that I know that I'm going deep into the, the words, right? So the NIV is more thought by thought that, that like the whole concepts are in there and it's good and it's, and it's pretty accurate. So I'm not saying it's not inaccurate and it's easier to read. Um, so if you, if you really want to go deep in the study, I would encourage you, grab an NASB Bible and just go deep. If you're like, I'm just new to this and trying to understand it, grab the NIV Bible and read it. And I would say start in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and just learn about this guy, Jesus. Learn what he did, how he walked, who he was, okay? Um, but I wanted to throw that out there because I haven't really talked about that on a Sunday. Um, so you're going to see me teach other NASB. If you have got the app, you can easily just click and switch if you want to, but um, okay, so everybody with me? Okay, all right. So uh, Luke chapter 5, Jesus, um, he's being kind of pressed in by a bunch of people listening to, a, to him teach, because at this point, he's like teaching things that are different, and they're like, who is this guy, and what is he teaching, and he's, he's done some miracles and stuff, and, um, and we're going to see him show up on, a, uh, on the shore of the sea, okay, with some fishermen, all right? So everybody with me? If you are, say, yep. All right, so Luke chapter 5, starting verse 1. Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around him and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. And he saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were washing their nets. So so go back in in time here, and let's kind of put ourselves in their their shoes, okay? To, to, To see what was going on. If you were a fisherman, I mean, you were a hard worker, right? I mean, even today, people who uh, by trade are fishermen, it is hard, long work. Um, and, and so these guys were pretty rough, um, pretty strong. Their hands are probably pretty uh, leathery, you know, from all the working the nets and all the things that they did. And we're going to learn in just a minute that they had already been out fishing the whole night, all night long fishing. And uh, I, do we have anybody in here who loves to fish? Any, any fishermen? Okay. Like, I'm, I don't. I'm not that guy. So I'm preaching the sermon. Just, I don't like touching fish. I like eating them. They're delicious, right? But, um, but have you ever had one of those times where you went to go fishing and you caught nothing? You know how frustrating that is? It's like you spent all that time. I remember one time my son Grayson and I, uh, we rented a boat down on Indian Lake uh, on the west side of Ohio. And and it was really hot that day. And he's like, I want to go fishing. I want to catch a fish. I want to go fishing. And how many fish did we catch, Grayson? Lily pads. Lily pads. All right. So <laughs> zero fish. I mean, it was, and, and you know, you don't fish on a really hot day because they're not up at the surface and, and that kind of thing. But it can be so frustrating when you don't catch fish. Imagine these guys. This is their income. This is their livelihood and their life. And they just fished all night and caught nothing. I mean, and now they're on the shore. Jesus is coming up, and they're cleaning their nets. That's what they would do at the end. They would clean out the nets. They would untangle them. They'd get them ready for the next time they're going to go out. So they're finished for the day. Um, I don't know what you feel like at the end of your work day. Uh, I know for me, it's like, whew, you know, it's like I'm done. I'm tired. It's been long. And, uh, and their job was even harder than what I do by far physically. And, um, and so they're just, they're just doing their thing that they do every day, and they're out there just cleaning their nets. This crowd then shows up. Jesus is teaching. Now, this isn't the first time we're going to learn that Simon Peter, uh, James, and John are some of the characters in this, in this scene. This isn't the first time they've seen Jesus. Actually, earlier, John the Baptist, who was preparing the way for when Jesus would show up and, and start doing his ministry, John the Baptist was hanging out, and he told one guy, he said, oh, there he is, the Messiah, the Son of God, and he went and found another guy. Somebody went and found Simon Peter, and is like, this is him, this is Jesus. And so they've already known what this, who this guy is, um, but this is going to be a completely different encounter than, oh, that's him, that's what he's doing, that's what he's teaching. And so this crowd's coming, and Jesus is teaching. He was standing by the lake, okay? And so they were out washing their nets at the end of their night of, of work. And, and Jesus, he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's. You see, it's Simon Peter. So you guys know who Peter is. He became, becomes one of the disciples. So Simon Peter. And asked him to put out a little way from the land. And he sat down and began teaching the people from the boat. Um, 
this is like really good thinking, right? If you're being pressed in by the crowds, and it's like, okay, I can't even like talk over you guys. I want to sit and teach. And, and so he goes out in the boat and he sits and the crowd is kind of on the, on the shoreline as he's sitting and talking uh, to everybody. So Simon Peter, obviously he had to stop cleaning his nets and he takes Jesus out so that he can teach. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Now, if you've just finished your cleaning job on your nets, and you've already had a long night where you haven't caught a darn thing, and somebody says, let's go out, let's go fishing, what would be your first instinct? Thank you. Honest man over here. No. I'm tired. It's been a long, and then now you're holding me up here. My breakfast was waiting for me, uh, and now I'm sitting here. You were taught, and it was great, Jesus, you know. I'm sure Jesus was a great teacher. You'd want to sit there and listen to him, but uh, we know even with great teachers, there were people that fell out of windows when they were tired, right? Like, that's later on in the book of Acts. So, um, and so, like, I, I could imagine him be like, oh, man, really? Really? And so Simon answered and said this, Master, we worked hard all night long. He wanted to speak his peace. Like, <laughs> it's been a long night, Jesus. But, he says, uh, and we caught nothing but I will do as you say and let down the nets. So even though he was tired, even though he had already been fishing and caught nothing, even though he was ready to go in and eat breakfast and rest so he could do it again to the next night, he said, even still, Jesus, I will go out and do it. Now, I'm sharing a story that many of us in this room have heard this story before, right? And uh, I grew up in church, so this, was like, this is like one of the classic Sunday school lessons. You know, but I think we miss what what Jesus is doing sometimes when we read the stories, or maybe we go back to things we learned back in the past. And I'm wondering, there's there's some key words here that that for me, um, this was back in in June as I as I read this story, and I felt like it was like in a new light that I read this whole scene of what was going on and Jesus' interaction with these guys. And there's certain words I, I didn't really like put a whole lot of weight into earlier. But when he says put out into deep water. Put out into deep water. And then let's go fishing. Uh, there's something different about fishing in the shallow end, right? Because in the shallow end, what is there? It's all the babies, the minnows, right? And all that kind of stuff. And, and you may catch some things. I know as a kid, I went, I went fishing when I was really little, and we would just fish right off the, you know, edge of the pond, and we'd catch the little things and stuff. But when you go out to the deep waters, you're going to be doing some different kind of fishing, aren't you? It's going to be a different experience. I feel like there's some spiritual things here that we need to understand, that God may be calling us as a church, as a whole, all of us together, to go out to the deep waters. Because that's where the fish are. To go out, even though maybe we're doing ministry, maybe we're serving and, and doing things, and maybe there's times where we're tired. But when Jesus calls us to go to the deep waters, I'm hoping that we will be like Simon Peter, be like, I'm, I'm a little tired, but, but let's go. Let's go. Because he has some deep things for us in the deep waters. And, and he wants us to go fishing. He wants us to do what, what Simon Peter is about to experience. And to be part of the story. So physically they went out <laughs> in the boat. Physically they went to the deep waters. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish. Imagine Simon's feelings then, right? Like all night frustration. All night frustration. All night frustration. Jesus in the boat changed something, didn't it? <laughs> all of a sudden they're catching fish. I mean, the net is filling up with a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. As a, as a business owner, you're thinking, oh no, right? Like, this is what I use. I can't break the nets because I got to go fishing tomorrow. Um, but Jesus is like, don't worry, you're not going fishing tomorrow, right? We're going to change the story here in just a minute. And so, so they're hauling in this, like, great load of fish. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. 
this is a fisherman's dream, right? This is like, oh my gosh, this is retirement right here. I, we're going to make a lot of money on these fish. Oh my goodness. And, and what would your response be? You know, think about if you were there and you experienced that, what would you be feeling? I think joy, right? Like, what? That'd be crazy. Crazy. But when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet saying, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. See, Simon Peter's view of Jesus changed because of personal experience with him in the boat, in the deep waters. It was, Jesus is a good teacher. Jesus, I think he's the Messiah, to Jesus, I'm a sinner. I'm not worthy. Because what you just did, this is miraculous. This is, this is beyond crazy. This is never, I've never seen this happen. Ever in my entire life. And he was broken by the moment. So, I'm a sinner, go away from me. You don't know what I've done. You don't know what I've said. You don't know what I said last night when I was fishing. They weren't good words, Jesus, right? Like, for amazement had seized him and all his companions because of the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Now, their response at the end is awesome because this is what I want you to hear in all this because it's an invitation. It's an invitation to all of us in this room. And Jesus said to Simon, do not fear. Shame brings fear, doesn't it? The, the sense of your brokenness, your sin, the things that you think are hidden, but they're really not, brings fear and condemnation. And that's what Simon Peter was overwhelmed. I'm a sinner. Go away from me. Jesus' first word, don't be afraid. Don't fear. Don't fear. From now on, you will be catching men. When they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Everything. That's pretty radical, right? It's like, what? You guys just had the biggest catch. I mean, you could have cashed that in. You could have went on vacation next week, taking your family out. You could have, you know, fill in the blank. It's like, no, because of Jesus with us, that is worthless. What I thought was valuable, the thing I was giving my life to, actually has very little value compared to what Jesus has done for me. Do you think the hope inside of them changed? Absolutely, right? And this is the invitation for all of us as we're talking about bringing hope, loving always. We are invited into the same journey with Jesus to go to the deep waters where the fish are, where the broken people are, where the sinners are that he is seeking and wanting to save, that we get to go and he is going to make us fishers of men. In the uh, book of Mark, he says it this way. He says, and Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and they followed him. I will make you not just a better person, not just less of a sinner, you know, so you can sin less. Um, I'm going to make you something great. I want to make you a fisher of men the deep waters of the soul spiritually to bring people to salvation. That is our invitation, church. That's your invitation for personal impact. That the hope that you have received, the hope that is in you, you get to be the one that shares the reason for why it's there and go fishing in the deep waters. I'm telling you, people are all around us every day, every day. It takes a shift, though, in our hearts and our minds. See, when you first come to know Christ, there's some things about us, right? When we first come to know Christ. And some of these aren't wrong. It's not bad. Um, it just is. You know, a lot of times when we first come to know Christ, it's really our relationship with them is about me. It's like our, our prayers kind of are wrapped around, like, my life. You know, like the, the, it's like, okay, Jesus, um, help me with my work. Help me find a job. Help me find a, a spouse. Help me to do this or help me to do that. Or, and a lot of times the prayers at the beginning, really, they're all about me. Like, what, what can I get? How can I receive good things and blessings? And, um, and there's nothing wrong with those things. I don't I want you to hear, like, it's wrong to pray for that stuff. It's not. It's not. If that's all you pray for, now we got an issue, <laughs> right? Um, because the shift in our spiritual growth moves from when our spirituality is just for us to where it's actually for others. Uh, you can write this down, okay? Because I think this is, this is what we need to grow into. When we grow from a spiritual, I would say, infant or spiritual children, 
where it's all about me and getting and receiving. And even when we come to church, it's kind of like, what, do, what am I going to get out of church? What am I going to experience? And really what you get is for you and to fill you up. Um, it's okay to live in that season for a little while. If you get stuck there, though, now, now like I'm saying, we have an issue. Because as we grow spiritually, we grow from not what can I get, but what can I give? What can I give? Jesus has called us to be givers of our life, to live for something greater and bigger than ourselves, and to move from me to you, right? It's from me-centered to God and other-centered as we grow spiritually. And, and I'm not saying these things to accuse anybody, all right? I'm just saying this is just natural. It's just naturally how our lives go. Um, but what we, we see with Jesus with these guys, these knucklehead fishermen, they shifted pretty quickly, didn't they? Because their life was about them. Here's my day-to-day. Here's my work. I'm going fishing. I'm cleaning my nets. I'm going fishing. I'm cleaning my nets. I'm going fishing. I'm cleaning my nets. This is my life. I'm taking care of things, taking care of business. And then Jesus comes and says, okay, that was great, but now, now I'm going to make you fishers of men. It's no longer just about what you get. Actually, you're going to leave everything and you're going to follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I'm telling you, Jesus wants to make us. He wants to work in us. And he wants us to see what is breaking his heart. Seek and save the lost. I'm going to keep repeating myself. Is that okay? All right. Here, anyways, okay. Let me say it this way. Um, if I were to translate it, this is what he's saying. If you follow me, I want to leverage what is temporary. I mean, he wants to leverage that what we have that is temporary. Because we all have stuff, we all have things. We, you know. He wants to leverage those things in our life that are temporary for the sake of something eternal. Because honestly, you are positioned perfectly where you work, where you go to school, in your family. Uh, in, in the club you're a part of, in the sport you love to play, or your kids love to play, whatever sphere of influence, to fish for people, to bring hope and to love always. That's the invitation. Follow me, and I will make you. Fishers of men. Fishers of men. Now, we have a problem with fishing. Do you know what the problem is? This is, a, this is my main point right here. Ready? Fish stink. Everybody say that with me. Fish stink, right? Um, you go by the sea and there's dead fish. It stinks. It's, it's a smelly line of work, you know? And, um, and that's just the truth, right? Fish stink. And, and, and I'm not saying that just to be comical. Like, when we think about going fishing for men, for people, right, relationships, we know that there are sinners who live messy lives. I was one, right? Like, like that's what life is. Life is full of messy, stinky things. And, uh, and I want to talk about that for all of us in this room as we, before we even like jump in and go out to the deep water as a church, we need to understand that fish stink, that when, where there are sinners, there are messes. And what I see Jesus doing all through the gospels is not running away from the messes. He runs towards them. He runs after them. He invites the messes so he can change it, meet them, and grow them. He's not, uh, he doesn't run away from it. And I think so often as, as Christians, we run away from the messes a lot of times uh, because there's, it, it, we're afraid that it's going to cause us personal pain. We are really good at, uh, at avoiding pain. Did you know that? That's one of our like human instincts. If there's something that we know is going to hurt us, I'm not doing it, right? Um, there are some crazy people who do things that hurt themselves and they love it and they have this adrenaline rush as they do it. They're crazy, right? But like I'm saying, most of us, when it comes to especially emotional things or messy things, we will do whatever it takes to avoid pain. Jesus never avoided it. He walked into it. He, he walked towards the stinky fish and he engaged them. See, when we, when we have relationships with people at work or at school or where, wherever you are, um, we cannot ever expect something out of somebody else that was never put in them to begin with, right? 
So like I know that there, there are people in our community who uh, have grown up in cycles of poverty and generational sin over and over and over again and they have lived and grown up in that and that's then the way they think. That's the way they process life and relationships. And so for me as a Christ follower to say, I know you need Jesus, but can you clean up your act a little bit and then come to Jesus? Could you do that, please? It's for me to not meet them right where they are. It's for me to judge them for where they are. See, I can't expect something out of somebody that was never put in them in the first place. And so when we think about messy people, we need to, as a church, as a church body, we say no perfect people allowed. Sometimes we mean it, sometimes we don't, right? Sometimes it's like, well, they're a little too imperfect. Like, (laughs) that broken situation is really messy. And so, or you call the pastor, can you take care of this? It's like, are you closer to the mess than I am? Then take care of it. Meet them, love them, bring hope. Because that's what we're all called to do, right? We can't expect something out of anybody that hasn't already been put into them. And I see Jesus do this all the time in relationships. And we're going to talk about some of the stories as we go through this. That he meets people right where they are. And so w- when you think about that coworker that just continually has the same issue over and over and over again, what are you called to do? Bring hope, love always. Teachers, when you have that student that's driving you nuts and you see the way they think and the way they live, what are you supposed to do? Bring hope, love always. When you have that wayward child that you're praying for that will come home, or they're doing things that you strongly disagree with and you just want to cut them out of your life because of it, I'm telling you, you do that, you're missing the God opportunity in your kid's life. Bring hope, love always. This is where messy stuff happens, right? That's God's call for us as Christ followers to live into it. Stinky fish and all. Um, now, now, can I encourage you with something else, though, with this when we're talking about stinky fish? It's okay to create boundaries. It's okay to create boundaries. Uh, my wife Nikki and I were talking about fishing, and when she was uh, 11 or 12, uh, her dad on vacation did a lot of things that were, like, adventurous. And so he took her out to go deep-sea fishing on one of these charter boats. You know, it's like the whole boat is lined up with people, and um, they're going out, and they're catching some crazy, you know, looking stuff. And, um, and she was telling me about it, that, like, when she was on the boat, she started not feeling good. She started feeling queasy. And uh, I know for me, if she felt queasy, I would have already been like green and like feeding the fish. You know what I'm saying? Like overboard, like, um, and, <laughs> and, and she was like, I don't know what to do because it's not like a two minute, you know, hike back to the shoreline and drop you off and then come back out. Um, and so she was out there, she was feeling worse and worse. Stinky fish, people doing things that smells. Um, And her dad told her to do something. He said, you need to eat something. Eat something. And the moment she did, she started feeling better. Her stomach kind of settled down. And and I think for us, as we are thinking about going fishing in the deep waters, deep sea fishing, (laughs) to people that might be messy and broken, they're already around us. um, One thing I want you to be careful of is to not get sucked into things emotionally or relationally that actually end up harming you in a way that, that you um, can't pull up out of. Does that make sense? Um, you have to be sure that you're feeding yourself. You have to be sure that you are growing and spending time with God every day. If you're going to go deep sea fishing, you've got to be prepared spiritually for what the enemy wants to do and attack because he doesn't want people freed. He doesn't want people saved. He doesn't want people sought out by Jesus. And so he will attack. He will bring harm. He will uh, inflame the people's issues in their life. And we have to be prepared for that, which means you got to feed yourself to get rid of your spiritual queasiness. <laughs> you know, you got you to come on Sunday mornings and be around other people who, who worship like you, who, who, where you can learn and grow and get filled up every single week. That's why we do this. Because I don't know about you, I need this every week. I do. I need challenged every week and encouraged every week and worship every week so that I can get through my week, you know? 
And I think all of us need that. You got to feed yourself when you're deep sea fishing. So I want to throw that warning out to us as a church. Let's feed on God's word. Let's feed on community and relationship with healthy people, the people around us who love us. Let's get into, into prayer and trusting him. But the other part of that story that, that Nikki was telling me about, as, as they were fishing, they had, you know, the, the pros on, on deck to ready to take care of issues as people were fishing. And I don't know how many fisher, fishing stories you've heard, right? Like, it was this big, right? It was like that big. And, you know, like, f- they do that kind of stuff. But, but she was saying that right next to them, there was a guy who caught a fish that was dangerous. Like, as he, they were pulling it up, it was a barracuda, a big barracuda. If you haven't seen it, their teeth are nasty. And he's like, we're not bringing this thing on board. We've got kids, and we've got a lot of people on here. And so he went, and he just cuts the line. Let that one go. He's not coming up here. There may be times when you're around stinky fish that there is a healthy barrier you need to create. That they are actually on the attack, and they will take you down in the process. And I'm telling you, it's okay to protect yourself or your family spiritually or physically or relationally if somebody is a barracuda <laughs> if their teeth are out and they're ready to devour you it's okay to create a barrier when you're deep sea fishing with certain people that doesn't mean you stop loving them but it does mean you won't be with them right physically so i, I want to give us some tools and and i want us to have the heart of jesus i want us to feed ourselves so that when we go fishing, we're ready, we're filled up, we're excited to be there. And I want to see what Jesus is going to do as all of us learn through this series how, how to go fishing. How do we actually do that? How do you make a personal impact to those around you? Because right now we're just setting the stage on how to do this. I don't know about your spiritual life. That moment when you went from death to life, that moment where Jesus did something in you, you're like, I can't, I can't even barely explain what he did, but he changed me. So often in people's lives, here is the equation. It's usually the message of hope brought from a messenger with hope and love into the middle of a crazy circumstance or situation when salvation is experienced. I don't know if that's your story. I know it's a lot of stories. And even after you've come to know Christ, a lot of times it's those moments where you experience more hope because Jesus meets us in the middle of crazy. Um, I want us to be the messengers. I want to be the messengers. So God, I pray that you would put inside of us this passion to be fishers of men, the calling that you called your disciples to follow you, to leave Leave the temporary behind and invest in the eternal, the things that matter most. God, that as we do that, as a church, that you just open our eyes, God. There are people all around us. There are people all around us who need you, who need love, who need hope. And God, I'm just going to pray right now for all of us that you, even as we're about to sing, as we are praying, that you would put a face in our minds right now a name on our hearts that we would start praying for that needs salvation that you're already seeking. That you're already seeking. Here's my challenge this morning. And it's just this. And as a prayer, God, open our eyes to see the hopelessness around us. Just open our eyes to where the fish are, to the deep seas. And the challenge is, are you going to accept the call to fish for men? Are you going to be about the eternal and about people? Or maybe right now, is your life really focused and burdened by the temporary? It may be time to shift, shift our spiritual growth and to not what can I get, but what can I give? And what is he calling you to give? 
We're going to sing a song here in just a moment. It's the song we sang at the beginning. It's a driving song. It's an upbeat song. It's a song of proclamation. God, burn inside my soul, right? Set me on fire. Give me a passion. I think there are too few people who live with passion. I, I, I think when people do live for passion, we think they're weird, right? It's like simmered down, you know? I don't want to, I want to burn with passion for the right things and for the God things. This is what the word passion means. This is what it means. It's a strong feeling of enthusiasm or excitement for something or about doing something. That's the passion we're talking about. A passion for God and a passion to go fishing. That's, that's what we're talking about. And we want God to burn that in our hearts and our souls as we think about these people, as we let him bring names to mind. Here's something I want you to do this week, a little homework, okay? I want you to scroll through all the people that you text messaged over the last five days and just look at their names. And as you do that, look at the names of people that you know need hope and just pray for them. That's it. Just pray for them. That's your homework. Pretty easy, I think. So let's do it. Let's do it. Let's stand together. We want to sing this song again. And we want to proclaim what we have received and what God has done in us. So God, as we sing, as we proclaim this passion, I pray that it would be not just from an emotional thing. It wouldn't be just because the pastor said so. It wouldn't be just because that was a, uh, something we read in scriptures. God, I want it to burn inside of us because of who you are and because you are the one putting a passion inside of our hearts for those that you are seeking and saving. And God, that you would set our soul on fire, our hearts on fire for something bigger, something greater than what we've even experienced today. Something bigger spiritually, God, that we, that we look forward to, look forward to you doing in our lives personally, but then what you're gonna do through us and in us. And so God, just lead us as we sing this to you, as we proclaim it over our own hearts and souls, set our soul on fire for you.